They believed in building up communities that are rooted in relationships between individuals who are committed to virtues, including prudence, including temperance, and including wisdom. Uh, these are things that Kirk certainly emphasized. And in King's case, he had a great emphasis on wisdom and, of course, a great emphasis on love, agape love, this idea of compassion. And they both drew their inspiration in a substantial way, of course, from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. In their own time, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Russell Kirk occupied different ends of the political spectrum. Their philosophies inspired the two most powerful movements of the age, the nonviolent movement, which led the larger civil rights movement, and the modern conservative movement. Without King and Kirk, Modern American social justice liberalism and modern American conservatism as we know them would not exist. And yet, for all of their differences, our modern politics suffer because contemporary liberalism and conservatism lack the grounding in virtues, communitarian values, and faith in an ordered universe that both King in nonviolence and Kirk in conservatism held fast to. Is it possible that by reacquainting ourselves with these lost traditions, we could summon the better angels of left and right and restore a politics of virtue for the modern age? In this episode, I talk to John Wood Jr., National Ambassador for Braver Angels, about the overlap in first principles between Dr. King and Russell Kirk and reducing partisan polarization in our divisive times. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. John Wood Jr. is National Ambassador for Braver Angels, America's largest bipartisan grassroots organization dedicated to the work of political depolarization. He is also an opinion columnist for USA Today. Prior to that, Wood was a nominee for Congress in California's 43rd District in the 2014 election cycle, afterwards serving as second vice chairman of the Republican Party of Los Angeles County, America's largest county-level Republican Party. John is highly regarded as a public speaker on matters of racial and political reconciliation. He is a member of the Progress Network, an initiative of the New America Foundation dedicated to foster civilizational progress through thought leadership across a wide spectrum of views, a field builder with New Pluralists, a collaborative of organizations dedicated to civic bridge building and racial justice, and an advisor with the American Project, an initiative of the Pepperdine School of Public Policy dedicated to restoring the communitarian roots of conservatism. John Wood Jr., welcome to Acton Line. Man, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. So we're speaking ahead of an event that you're doing with us here at the Acton Institute uh, this evening on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, the headline, the title of uh, this lecture is Martin Luther King Jr. and Russell Kirk, A Consensus of First Principles. Not two people that I think most would uh, put together, and especially not with the word consensus. Surprising but, uh, juxtaposition, huh? Yeah, it is. So <laughs> tell us about it. What is, uh, what is this consensus on first principles that you see between King and Kirk? Right, absolutely. So, you know, I mean, certainly it is the case that in their own time, so King and Kirk were contemporaries. And it's a funny thing, it's not even uh, clear to me that, you know, that they ever had, they probably never had any direct interaction, but it's also not even clear that Russell Kirk or King ever commented on on the other. Uh, and yet, each of them, uh, I think we can safely say, was responsible for catalyzing the most significant movements uh, of their of their time. Uh, neither the civil rights movement nor the conservative movement were the wholesale product of one individual, 
But you wouldn't have the conservative movement as we know it without Russell Kirk. You wouldn't have had the civil rights movement as we know it with Martin Luther King Jr. Without Martin Luther King Jr., you certainly would not have had the the nonviolent movement, uh, which sort of you know drove the mainstream of civil rights uh, progress. Um, Dr. King was politically speaking uh, liberal in in the vast main. Um, you know, folks have looked at his political legacy from different angles, and at times conservatives have tried to adopt him. But he he was you know pretty clearly uh, somebody who was politically to the left. Russell Kirk, on the other hand, was somebody who politically was clearly to to the right, supported Barry Goldwater and, and others. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the skepticism is justifiable. But what's interesting is that the conservatism of Russell Kirk and the, um, you know, the, the liberalism of Dr. King, although really what I'm focusing in on here is Dr. King's philosophy of nonviolence, represented ways of looking at humanity, society, and reality – that were grounded in certain first principled assumptions that I would argue are largely lost to us in today's culture of social justice as well as today's culture of conservatism, that we desperately need to get these first principles back in order to get the best out of both liberalism and conservatism today. And that moreover, if we can revive this sort of consensus of first principles as much as we can, that it may in fact establish a bit of a bridge between the left and right in our own time that can set us on the path towards some significant social healing in the context of our, of our perilously fractured uh, democracy and political discourse. And so those, those first principles uh, really come down to this. Number one, uh, Russell Kirk and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, both believed in an ordered universe. They believed that there was – that there is a creator uh, who guides the arc of events and this has definite implications uh, for the way they thought about and engaged uh, politics, uh, philosophy, activism. They had a confidence in the idea of a creator which attended a humility with respect to that which human beings could innovate in seeking to sort of recreate the world, um, which meant that they were deeply concerned with a second area of first principled overlap between them, uh, which is in the area of virtue. They both uh, had a decided commitment to and a stark emphasis on uh, virtue uh, in character as being that which animates uh, healthy citizenship, healthy civic and, and political activism, and ultimately uh, uh, a belief in virtue as being the thing that grounds um, society in a way that allows communities uh, to function and flourish well. And which brings us to the third area of overlap that I observe, which is the fact that both Kirk and King were fundamentally communitarian. Um, they were individuals who believed uh, not in a hyper individualism and not really in a hyper – as you might think based on where the conservative movement went might be the case with Kirk and not in a hyper collectivism, which based on where, you know, sort of the progressive movement, uh, you know, comes from and goes forth to, you might think might have been the case with King. Uh, they both had uh, in their own ways uh, a distrust of sort of the broad kind of sameness making, sort of leveling, sort of, you know, uh, uh, impulse that a lot of political philosophy and uh, sort of brings with it and that governments oftentimes, you know, subject people to. They believed in building up communities that are rooted in relationships between individuals who are committed to virtues, including prudence, including temperance, and including wisdom. Uh, these are things that Kirk certainly emphasized. And in King's case, he had a great emphasis on wisdom and, of course, a great emphasis on love, agape love, this idea of compassion. And they both drew their inspiration in a substantial way, of course, from the Judeo-Christian tradition. So uh, – and I guess I, I could actually add a fourth uh, level of uh, area of overlap uh, to, to those, which is that they both also had a deep distrust of materialism. 
sort of connected to their sort of uh, sort of shared sense that you know life well lived and society well understood is one in which we are grounded in transcendent and eternal truths and that you know those who see uh, the goods of life as being limited to the material things fail not only to do good for society but fail good to do fail to do good for themselves fail to get the most out of themselves as, as human beings uh, so that's one that you could actually add to the list. So they both believed in an ordered universe. They both were committed to virtue. They both were committed to community. And they both uh, had a skepticism of materialism that sort of sort of uh, is, is a bit of a companion um, uh, uh, point of agreement uh, to sort of the spiritual uh, piece. And in the absence of those shared principles, what we have today, I would argue, is a politics in which we are either hyper-individualistic or hyper-collectivist, a politics in which we rely on politics, whether we are trying to limit the size of government or expand the power of government, we rely on politics to fix our problems without having a greater confidence in the idea that our actions, our activities are unfolding within the landscape of a greater, uh, of a greater intention. Uh, and I think that that tends to leave people feeling uh, more paranoid, more fearful, more reliant on their own, on their own uh, devices, less confident in our, in our ultimate sort of, you know, path uh, as, as human beings. Um, and uh, a politics in which we judge rightness and wrongness not on the basis of conduct, not on the basis of honor and integrity and love and compassion, but more on the basis of who has the right intellectual answer, who has the right ideological answer, right? That becomes in today's politics the test of whether or not you're a good human being, not the things that you actually demonstrate in your character. Because human beings are fallible. Our saving grace is the fact that we at least have the potential to learn from our mistakes, uh, to build together, to work together. But that doesn't happen if we don't have a shared commitment to forgiveness. That doesn't happen if we don't have a shared commitment to honor and to integrity and the things that are laid out uh, in, in the Gospels and in our, in our richer moral traditions. A politics devoid of that is a politics of of endless recrimination, endless acrimony, and ideological and cultural wars. And I think that in the roots of, of conservatism and in the roots of, you know, in, in the Kingian roots of, of social justice, we actually find resources that can rescue us from that spiritual and moral uh, hollowness that so much of our mainstream politics suffers from today. And so those are the deep areas of overlap that I see King and Kirk having. Their, you know, their substantial differences in the politics of their own time, notwithstanding. Well, I think that's that actually leads me to the question I want to ask you is, uh, in a way, I think these two individuals would be very well suited to observing these kinds of overlap between them on first principles. Because uh, if you read Russell Kirk, um, especially I, I read earlier, well, not this this year because it's a new year. Last mm -hmm. year, uh, Matt Continetti's new book on the right mm. and. The sense of disagreement, not necessarily on where they were individually, but in their styles and what they approached between William F. Buckley and Russell Kirk kind of draws this out to me that he describes Kirk as being this literary figure, um, not as much engaged in the nitty gritty politics of the time, which you could correlate then to Buckley and National Review's position on the civil rights movement, um, which National Review and Buckley in those later years recognized was they were just wrong. They were just wrong on a lot of that. Um, so I think in and do you think in this way, um, even though as we have plenty of examples too, and it's again, Martin Luther King Day, a lot of these, because we have to make everything a political battleground, the pol more politically oriented quotes from Martin Luther King get drawn out in a way that aren't used to provide context to the man, yes. but are instead yeah. used to say these the, the things that we laud King for as Americans um, aren't really the focus, and it should be these political prescriptions that we should focus on. But because King spoke in the same kind of philosophical, religious, and literary terms that I think mm -hmm. Kirk often did, I think this makes them maybe more of a clear pair to draw these kinds of conclusions from than it may seem on the surface. That's right. That's right. Ru Russell Kirk was anti-communist, but he was not— he was not 
special because he was anti-communist. Dr. King was somebody who was, you know, fairly social democratic in his economic views. But that did not define what made Dr. King and his legacy truly profound and, and special, you know. Uh, Kirk uh, unearthed for us, gave to us a conservatism that was not an ideology really but was a cast of mind. You know, you read the conservative mind, you, you find yourself reading about personalities from, you know, Alexander Hamilton to John Randolph of Roanoke who were staunchly different, staunchly different people in terms of their, their policy views and, and so forth. But what they – all the thinkers in the conservative mind in – you know, tended to have in common was that they were building upon the edifice of tradition in various ways, recognizing the fact that reform is necessary and inevitable, uh, generally speaking, but that reform needed to be undertaken in a way that, to just sort of put it bluntly, you know, doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? That we understand the fact that things are as they have been for a reason, and that history and the future is an ongoing dialogue one to the other, where the latter builds upon the former rather than trying to eradicate the former or what was learned from the former, and that the existing sort of structures of our society are as they are for reasons that are demonstrable through time and it doesn't mean that things should not change. It just means that we have to be mindful of those changes. Uh, King on the other hand, you know, King was pressing for radical changes in society, you can say. And so, you know, this is why the idea that Kirk and King have anything deep in common will come as a surprise to people because, you know, Kirk was trying to remind people that, you know, there is – there is a way of being that calls upon us to conserve what is and only change things carefully where King was saying that, you know, look, we need to fundamentally change the way our society is operating in so many ways. And yet King himself in so doing though also put himself forward as striving to realize the American ideal. He was striving to realize the higher vision of the founding fathers of Abraham Lincoln and of those who had come before him in the context of an American project that he saw himself as being in dialogue with, not just an American project, but a Western project going all the way back to Plato and Aristotle. Uh, King saw himself as being in dialogue with the great thinkers of antiquity, the great thinkers and, and, uh, and men and uh, women of moral and, and religious courage that exist um, across the, uh, the the arc of of, of Western history, um, he had deep moral indictments of the West, but he also saw the redeeming value, you know, in that project. What he was aiming for was less a sort of you know rejection, you know, of all things. Western and a leveling of society in a way that would have, you know, had he believed in that, provided perhaps more common cause between him and the Marxists, with which I think he is oftentimes sort of falsely equated by, you know, both some, you know, critics on on the right historically, as well as some as some folks who think that they're on Dr. King's page uh, from the left. But what King was looking for was a society genuinely committed to equal opportunity in which the full flourishing of the human personality could come forth, right? And so in that sense, King and uh, Kirk shared a similar uh, concern because, you know, in, in writing about folks like Alexis de Tocqueville uh, and others, uh, their, you know, Kirk takes us on a journey through history where, you know, just to cite Tocqueville for a second, you know, Tocqueville, uh, writes about this uh, concern he has for a politics of a democracy of materialism in which the sort of the whole of the spiritual human being is lost in favor of kind of a material orientation towards rights where it's less about what you can become and more about what you can gain through positive rights and, and goods. And King, on the other hand, was responding against a status quo in the Jim Crow South where African Americans could not be full-fledged human beings because their freedom was a bridge, their ability to make choices and decisions for themselves um, was was abrogated. Uh, King and Kirk, uh, if we were to take Kirk as agreeing with uh, as agreeing with with Burke and uh, and uh, and others, both believed 
that freedom is implicit in the definition of man himself, that man is not man unless he is free. It is in his nature to be free. And yet his freedom exists within limits. And these limits come in the context of law and society, but they also come within the larger architecture of God's design. So the way King describes that uh, is to say that, you know, a man is is free to, to go to, I'm going to get this slightly wrong in the details, but a man is free to go to Miami and he's free to go to New York, but he's not free to go south to New York or north to Miami, say, for a long trip uh, around the world. Uh, King and Kirk both believed essentially the sacredness of human personality and human freedom, but they also believed that God and uh, had a hand in providence, that God basically was sort of marking the destination of man. And so King said that man is free uh, to choose the nature, is to choose uh, the destination of his nature uh, that is given to him by God, right? Um, and, um, you know, the, um, the, the idea then that human personality is sacred meant that they both had a somewhat overlapping vision of what it meant for human beings to flourish, which suggests which suggest that um, their understanding of the good society was is, is one that, you know, doesn't just, again, sort of speak to having the right politics or speak to, you know, having sort of the right distribution of wealth, but requires us to be good people in touch with the points of, of, of character and virtue that make that that make that possible. You can't have transcendent commitments without a language of virtue, and it's harder to do that if you don't have a language of faith. But that animated the conservatism of Russell Kirk and the nonviolence of Martin Luther King. I feel uh, want to quote Lord Acton here as well, who pointed to the same idea: liberty is not the power of doing what we like, but the right to be able to do what we ought. Um, that points to uh, again. I think the first. Period of over, point of overlap that you identified as well of an ordered universe. Um, I, w- I want to come back to an observation that you made about uh, King and his rhetoric as well. That one of the, I can't remember who I heard make this observation first, but it, I think it stands in uh, really rough juxtaposition to a lot of the activists we see today who claim to be inheritors of King's mantle. That you hear King uh, invoke um, that you know, we are all. Uh, created equal and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. And then he speaks of this as a promissory note that uh, he and the civil rights movement are there to cash. Um, That is an appeal to the highest and best nature of the people of this country, to the founding impetus of this country. And we see an inversion of that now. I mean, we see that with uh, projects like the 1619 Project that points to um, kind of an original sin being the starting point for all of these conversations. And I always find that uh, interesting when you look at King's rhetoric and the success, the, the, the incredible success that the civil rights movement had by appealing to the best ideals of the American people, what they what That's they right. aspire to be mm-hmm. versus the kind of rhetoric that I think we see now, which is aiming far lower than that. Well, yeah, the rhetoric that we see now is deeply cynical with respect to the capacity of the United States uh, for evolution and redemption, even though I think that capacity has been proven across the entire arc of American history, as as frustrating as the areas in which we still need to progress are, and those areas are deep and painful, I would argue. You know, there's a lot of great history in the 1619 Project. They don't get every historical claim right, I don't think, but I always encourage people to read it and not, not dismiss it. The problem with the 1619 Project, in contrast to Dr. King's perspective, is simply that in the absence of an understanding of humanity, which says that we are all of us inevitably fallen, right, and that the point of life is really at the end of the day uh, to be able to transcend our own failings so as to help others do likewise, right, so that we may reach the, reach, you know, salvation but the beloved community uh, together, 
Um, you know, there's there's no way of sort of speaking to the better angels of people's nature because you're kind of operating from a position which says that they're not really there or there's not a lot to tap into there, you know, because let's say the American project is fatally, you know, fatally uh, marred by, by racism or perhaps by virtue of being white, you are sort of implicitly biased in a way that you're probably never going to really get over or not fully get over, you know. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, look, you've got different people in the anti-racist uh, sort of, you know, cohort who look at things, you know, somewhat differently. I don't like painting them all with a broad brush, but Nicole Hannah-Jones was the principal editor of the 1619 Project. You know, she said in a speech that she doesn't really expect anything she does to make a difference at the end of the day, you know. I mean, here's somebody who's who. Whatever you think of her politics, she's she's very she's very gifted. She's very accomplished. You know, she's actually a wonderful writer and editor and so forth. And you would think that she could look at her work and think that she'd done good in a way that makes a difference in the world. But if she was honest in that statement, it's deeply sort of depressing. There's no way that you know uh, Dr. King could have inspired a nation, and that others in the nonviolent movement could have inspired a nation the way they did, if they were not fundamentally coming from a place of hope. Uh, and and they were hope and confidence in the redemptive capacity of man and of the United States of America in in particular, and through that hope, you know, he really was able to call out to the better angels of people's nature and help change uh, society, uh, help change society um, for the better. Right. A term you used earlier on in the conversation: social justice. Um, how do you define social justice and how do you draw then um, the, from that definition the nexus again between um, the work of Russell Kirk and uh, Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, the term social justice is sort of famously kind of difficult to, uh, to, to define. It does have a history that's much older than people know. It, it goes back, you know, you, I think you find its origins in Europe, maybe in Italy somewhere. And I wouldn't be the person to, to give you the deep history on how the phrase sort of evolved. But it was a phrase that Dr. King used. He also used the term racial justice. And I think the most useful thing to do is to just look at the phrase and what it sort of connotes. Social justice. There is social there was there was, and I think you can argue is social inequality in the United States. That's not just a function of people's differing levels of merit, but that is also very much a function of pre-existing the operations of pre-existing structures and institutions and and structures and institutions, as well as pre-existing social attitudes, right? And so when Dr. King talks about social justice, in his case at least, I think he's looking to sort of remedy kind of the inequality that comes through having institutions that by virtue of the way they, they operate reinforce inequality. And uh, I think he's responding to the idea that you have social norms that uh, enforce you know, not just inequality, but just sort of a cutting short of human potential. And that's grossly unjust, right? These are questions of justice, sometimes in a straightforward legal sense, and sometimes just in a higher moral sense. Um, I'm not sure that it's hard for me to imagine. Uh, uh, I'm not, I don't know if anybody ever asked Russell Kirk what he thought of the phrase social justice itself. But I do think that it's very clear that Russell Kirk uh, had a deep concern with society progressing in a way to where the operation of society uh, cut short uh, human potential and the possibility of human flourishing. I think that Kirk was simply more concerned about it from the direction of the great sort of equalizing brute, force of, brute forces of centralization, right? And perhaps socialism, uh, and also sort of the kind of you know the the sort of uh, uh, traditionally sort of you know enlightenment rooted sort of liberal orientation to sort of you know intellectualizing our way through all problems without deep reference to the wisdom of the past. That these are all things that bring with them the potential uh, and perhaps the inevitability of taking too far. Uh, of reducing the human condition to one in which we more or less just become brutes 
seeking our material self-interest because, you know, we don't see ourselves as part of a grander order. We don't see ourselves as part of a grander design. We don't have a transcendent commitment to virtue. We don't see or recognize our connections to each other through community. Every hierarchy is a threat to my individuality and therefore every hierarchy must be deconstructed and, and cast down, you know. Uh, I think that if you were to posit the question to Kirk, is it sort of a social injustice when societies evolve in this way, I imagine he might might agree with that statement. Um, the term social justice, again, has become politicized to the point to where it just carries carries a lot of baggage, so it can be difficult to treat it objectively. But fundamentally, I don't see Kirk disagreeing with the idea that societies involve in ways that, uh, that diminish uh, the human condition and therefore, you know, render a social injustice that needs to be corrected uh, by conserving the wisdom of the past. For each of these men, you've identified a, for obvious reasons, a movement with them. So for Russell Kirk, you know, author of The Conservative Mind, his association with the conservative movement, and for Dr. King, um, not just the civil rights movement, but specifically the nonviolence movement to advance uh, those objectives. Um, if you look at those two respective movements as projects, um, moving from the 1960s to when we are talking about uh, these two individuals, to the modern day, what do you think the state of those respective projects is, the, cons the conservative project, and not just the continual work to advance civil rights, but through the form of nonviolence that Dr. Yeah. King advocated? Well, it's hard not to feel like we're at a little bit of a low point in each, <laughs> in each direction. Um, you know, I think conservatism today and for a long time, but more now, you know, in this moment then, I think, and in, in even recent decades past, uh, is one that I think seems to be hyper fixated on our occupying the right surface positions on matters of policy and even more so matters of culture. Um, you know, look, we are, we are very much uh, concerned with what we consider to be the radical excesses of, you know, social positions on the left when it comes to gender, when it comes to race, when it comes to any number of things. Traditional economic conservatism, of course, is largely unchanged in its essential principles, uh, although there are many, you know, I mean, you know, limited government, uh, economic freedom, although you are seeing an advance of people who want to use the power of the state to perhaps reinforce social and cultural norms in a way that seems like a pretty clear deviation from, you know, what conservatism had tended to, to be about. But the deeper problem with conservatism today is that one, well, it just gets back to our original three principles. One, there's not a great emphasis on community, right? There's, there's a sense that government crowds out community, but there's not an affirmative sort of commitment to what it takes to actually build communities because that has to do with building relationships, right? Um, two, there's not a great emphasis on virtue. I mean, you can find it in individual thinkers, you know, but that's not what's animating sort of like the mainstream of the cultural discourse on on the right. If it were certainly not the politics of it, certainly not the politics of it. I mean, you know, if it were, you know, our politics would not be so rabid. The way we talk to each other, the way that we engage each other, and we would not be so quick to elect politicians and vote for candidates who are so blatantly unconcerned with character and virtue and integrity and honesty and loyalty and honor and all of these other things, you know, um, we would not be so comfortable putting people up to fight culture wars who do not at the same time represent what is best in our culture, you know. And look, again, we are all fallen. So it's not to say that we need to hold such a standard of purity that we only vote for elect perfect people. Um, but if you are imperfect, as we all are, I think we all have an obligation uh, to, to apologize, to show humility, to to seek, you know, redemption and whatnot. I mean, that's that is at the heart of the Christian walk, you know, just about more just about more than anything else. And on the social justice side, you know, um, yes, what you have is in the mainstream of sort of the third wave kind of social social justice and anti racist movement. Broadly speaking, a a a, a a large abandonment of King's um, principles. The idea that we have to love our enemies, start with that. The, the, the heart of Kingian nonviolence is this principle over and above all others. 
that love is a spiritual force that can affect social transformation and that we have to not seek to defeat or humiliate our opponents, but to win their understanding and friendship so that we can be reconciled to each other in the beloved community. That's what King was after. But that's not what many people, uh, you know, in the, in the social justice um, in the mainstream, at least, uh, as we see it represented in, in, in media and as we see it taking to the streets oftentimes, that's not what folks are trying to do with, you know, quote, MAGA Republicans. That's not, <laughs> you know, what a lot of folks are trying to do with people that they also think are racist. Now, again, I don't want to paint with too broad, too broad a brush. I mean, I do think that the Kingian impulse is still alive. I think you can still find it, you know. I think you can still find it in the work of folks like Adam Taylor at Sojourners. I think that you can still find it in some of the things that, you know, Reverend Barber, uh, you know, says and does with the Poor People's Project. I think that you can find it in different, in different places. But, you know, it's sort of the vestiges, the echoes of, of, of King, as you can almost in real time hear him in terms of what he actually uh, truly taught on a moral level, fading, you know, in, into history. We have to fiercely revive our commitment to understanding what his teachings actually were. You know, because, uh, you know, people will emphasize, you know, King, you know, King, the uh, the, the the economic uh, progressive, you know, King, the, the radical activist, uh, King, uh, you know, the the uh, the the opponent of militarism. And, yeah, I mean, you know, in all sorts of ways, he was he was all of these things. It was his deep commitment to nonviolence and agape love, however, that made him the conscience of a nation. And it is those first principles of King that are being lost and forgotten today, just as I would argue the first principles of Kirk are being lost and forgotten on the right. And we need to bring them both back. I think that dovetails quite well into the last question that I want to ask, for, uh, ask you as we close up here. Uh, you are a national ambassador for Braver Angels, uh, which is uh, described here to me as America's largest bipartisan grassroots organization dedicated to the work of political depolarization. Tell me about the work of Braver Angels and then tell me about how uh, you as a representative of the organization and, and you as an individual in your work approach this idea of political depolarization, especially in as what everybody recognizes as being such a politically polarized time. That's right. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, you know, Braver Angels seeks to essentially revive the communal fabric of of American democracy and restore a culture of, and in some cases perhaps innovate it for the first time, uh, a culture of goodwill uh, in the republic. Uh, it's something that we do through uh, both uh, broader narrative, through media and podcast work and work uh, in which we seek to tell a story of who we are as Americans uh, that makes room for the idea that there's still a shared identity to be had as, as an American people from left to right, that we need one another, liberals and conservatives and everybody else in between, to complete the larger American project. Uh, and we do this concretely through programs, through methodology, uh, through through workshops uh, based on principles of family therapy, almost like marriage counseling for Republicans and, and Democrats, uh, and even through debate programs that we deploy across college campuses and local communities, uh, in city, state, and, and even federal government. We have programs rolling out in the United States Congress, uh, working with various committees. Um, programs and work done in corporations, in partnership with ministries, unions, civil society groups. It is a full-fledged effort by thousands of Americans across the country to establish designs for cultivating goodwill between the American people uh, that, that we are cross-pollinating across institutional and communal contexts uh, uh, and demographic contexts uh, throughout, throughout America. And so the idea is that we find new ways of engaging with each other based in goodwill that we then can take with us uh, to the places that we live and operate in American life. It's a systematic approach to creating goodwill as, a poor, as opposed to a systemic uh, approach to dividing the American people, which has been the norm in American institutional and political life and which now has to change. 
John Wood Jr. is National Ambassador for Braver Angels, America's largest bipartisan grassroots organization dedicated to the work of political depolarization. He's our guest here at the Acton Institute for a lecture this evening on Martin Luther King Day entitled Martin Luther King Jr. and Russell Kirk, A Consensus of First Principles. John, thank you so much for joining us today on Acton Line. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Cohn.